So it's Wednesday night, sort of. Um, yeah, it's been a while. Been since last July, I guess. Um, my guests tonight are Richard William Smith and Linda Maria Smith. And um, as you know, my background is archaeology, anthropology, and believe it or not, there's a huge disparity in definition or form and function when anthropologists describe culture, define culture, um, or try to define culture. Can we describe it in a sentence, in a paragraph, or does it take a lifetime to describe the concept of paradigm? Richard and Linda Smith are both students of human origin. And can we start there? Because I, I think that's what's so confusing about us, not just us three, but us in general. Um, so I wanna talk about where did we come from? And because I think it's very confusing um, to most people. And that's why we have so many different so many different beliefs and religions and, and ideas where we came from and where did we come from it's the chicken and the egg thing we had to come from somewhere or something but where did that place or thing start where did it come from so let's attack this at any angle you both prefer because you both study who we are and our relationships with the universe and those other relationships that have shaped us since the beginning so the Smiths are here. Who wants to go first? Let's let's start with you, ma'am, because uh, ladies first. And and welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's it's great to see you. Yeah, thank I've you been for reading, having us. Thank you. And wondering about you. I want to hear about it. <laughs> so to to answer that question, or to start off with that, what you said, um, I had that nagging feeling in me for the longest time. The story that of where I or my family came from just didn't sit right with me. Um, I heard maybe this much of the truth. And then everybody that I that I can ask or could have asked are all now deceased. So I started digging myself. I started doing a uh, family tree on ancestry. And then I finally bit the bullet and I got a DNA test done. And to my surprise, there were a lot, there was a lot more in me than what I was told. And it just, it blew my mind. So if, if we take a look at just my DNA alone, which is pretty much spread across the entire world, it's almost every continent, every country is in my DNA. Um, that makes me wonder, what about uh, interplanetary DNA? What if we could do that? When maybe we'd really find where we came from. So how, when you started yeah. thinking about this in terms of, of where you first came from, I mean, obviously, prior to getting a DNA test, it, we, what, was the, what was the question? I mean, there are so many people out there who struggled. You know, we, we talk about finding ourselves, and yeah. that's, that's super, super common. However, um, that means so many different things to so many different people. Was it, was it that kind of a question that started out, or was it deeper, deeper? Growing up, I heard, I've heard a couple of people ask me, well, what, who, where, where are you from or where are your family's from? You look Greek or you look uh, Middle Eastern or you, you don't look Spanish. And I grew up in a majority of a Spanish household. I'm fluent in Spanish. Um, and I kept saying, well, what do Spanish people look like? I mean, you go to a, every Spanish country, everybody looks a little bit different. You know, I think people just assume that because I'm Spanish, I'm supposed to look Mexican. I'm not sure. Um, and it just, the, the history or the, the story that I was told from my grandfather just didn't seem complete. And then he passed away in 96, so I really couldn't ask him anything. And then my parents passed away, my grandmother passed away. There's nobody to ask that really knows the history of our family. So... What you heard from him, was it sort of a conventional family was, history that we would kind of all hear? Yeah, that? yeah. it was. Yeah, uh, it was uh, our his side of the family somehow originated in Genoa, Italy. Then they migrated uh, to the Basque region of Spain. And then from there, they went to Colombia. And from there, they went to Cuba. And that's where my grandfather was born in Cuba. 
but it just and there seems to be like a concrete uh embedded resistance to going beyond yeah. those boundaries <clears throat> yeah that's to, to, to go beyond the norm yeah right right like we're cuban we're royalty we're, that's it yeah, we don't want to hear anything else i, I didn't I, <laughs> I couldn't get past that like i and I even tried on Ancestry looking for my grandfather's family because I have a very unique last name. My maiden name is Ruiz de Zarate. If you have that last name, we're all related because it's not like it's not like Smith, which is our last name. Just hundreds and thousands of us. There's a couple. Um, yeah, you know, a couple of us. Just yeah. a few. <laughs> I know one. Do you know him? His name's. Uh... So. I started digging and I can just go back so far with that Ruiz de Sarate last name. And it comes from the Basque region. It comes region, from the Basque region, yes. Which is a very mysterious dialect and origin itself. Right. That does not belong to Europe. So let's, let's just digress just for a minute here. And so why are the Basque considered so unusual? I mean, what would be the main reason that they're considered unusual? Because I think they are. They they have the uh, linguistic uh, researchers have yet to figure out where that language they call it a language isolate I think or something right. they yeah. they cannot connect it to any other languages. It's not part. It's, of, it's not, not part, part of, of the, the traditional Latin. No, base or it's anything. not. Um, it is so different. In fact, if you recently Netflix has even introduced Basque produced movies. Yeah. Bilingual, you can watch them in English, but you can watch them in Spanish, you can watch oh, them in Basque. Basque. Yeah. But when you look at the Basque subtitles or the Spanish subtitles, they are night and day. There yeah. is no similarity there. <laughs> so, <laughs> not even with France, and Basque shares the border on France and Spain. Um, they are fiercely um, nationalistic to their own heritage yeah, they don't like to be called spaniards or spanish there they're basque been ongoing civil war there because they refused to bend to spain or france's rule mostly well, spain kind of stuck with it right now i mean yeah. you look at the map and it says spain it doesn't say anything about basque you it look, says basque region that's it you look at the basque people it's very much like looking at the history of ireland or native americans or which they have genetically linked the celtics to the basques yeah Celtics, so yeah. I found that very interesting doing my research. This is so, what happens with your ancestry. You know, when at the further I dig into my DNA results and my ancestry, I ask myself even more, well, who am I? Because now I've opened up, my DNA has opened up almost every country. And it's and, and now I'm I want more now than I did before. I want more answers including the uh, the infamous Moai, Easter Island. Yeah, I had my DNA popped up on Easter Island too, which- Did they, did it give you a percentage? Uh, She's got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look at it all the time because it just, it blows my mind. Have my, I found out that I have Native American from three different places, uh, one of which is, the supposed defunct Tainos from the Caribbean. So. So how long ago did you do that? And I have oh, a reason within, for the within question. The past, within the past two years? Yeah. yeah. So, so I think it's been five or six years now since I did it. Of course, every time you look at it, it could change. And right. um, when I first did it, um, there was, there was, uh, I, the, well, like less than 1% Southeast Asia and oh. which was really odd to me that that would, I, you know, it makes you wonder, of course. And, and obviously she wondered um, because there were so many different, different connections there, but then, you know, two or three years later that, that uh, Asian part disappeared less than 1%. And, um, you know, I was kind of hopeful that I was, I was more English or whatever, but um, you know, and it seemed I became more Scandinavian than English. And, and so it's always different. It doesn't mean that it's inaccurate, but I think, you know, the, the technology that they use changes. So, um, yeah, you know, and, and obviously um, 
there's different markers from different people and, and the more, you know, the collection that they have or whoever they are that, that accumulates this information changes over time. So, um, you know, I think it's getting more dialed in and more accurate. So to me, that's an interesting thing and how that changes me thinking, of course, that, you know, that, that with these changes, um, you know, there, there, there's a common denominator between more people and, um, they're dialing down these mixes to, to more specificity than they were prior. Um, even though I thought it was interesting before, because to me, it, it, I just felt that there was, there was more of a relationship between people that, um, wouldn't seem related as much Mm -hmm. and, uh, especially geographically, but, um, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. So it is to answer your question. It says 1%. Yeah. Yeah. So how many, how many different, um, different uh, backgrounds did it did it break you down I mean you said you came from from a lot of different um, different yeah. regions on the planet and it, it's interesting because I mean some people really do and I think I, I may have had now maybe there's six but you know some people it says here that. overall 20 ethnicities <laughs> 20 <laughs> yes yeah it kind of blew my mind and it it made me I mean, I've always felt that everybody should be treated equally, regardless of your skin color or where you come from. And I, it makes me want to shout it from the rooftops that if if, just take your DNA, you'd be surprised. For example, let's, my father was, my father and my grandfather actually were horrible bigots they would constantly talk bad about anybody with dark skin constantly made myself and my sister cringe all the time I have more African blood in me than I ever thought I did (laughs) and I I I wish they were here so that I could show them to this and say look now you need to stop talking your crap right because it was horrible growing up listening to them my grandfather was like that too (laughs) <laughs> growing up with that <laughs> horrible it's, it's it was embarrassing i mean fortunately that doesn't really i mean yes it does have something to do with who we are but um you know at the at the root level at the genetic level it do, had, doesn't have anything to do with with who we are but of course what we learned along the way but um so what was the most interesting and, and shock maybe shocking thing to you and and as to your origin i mean Is there anything that you just can't explain? Yeah, there is. On my original 23andMe results, it said something to the effect of, hold on, because I was like, all right, well, what does that mean? Do I have alien DNA in me or something? I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, It says, hold on, open, open. Um. At the very bottom, it says 0.8% unassigned. They haven't figured that part out yet. <laughs> so what that's does that the, mean? That's, that's the mailman or something. Yeah. <laughs> several several that that generations mean? ago. Unassigned. So how, how do you not? I mean, you have all this other information of all the other countries that my DNA is from. How do you have 0.8% unassigned? Right, right. And that's, and that's pretty common. I, you know, obviously I, I did ancestry.com and, and that changes, but yeah, there's that question mark too. And uh-huh. uh, unfortunately I can't see mine right now, but it doesn't really matter. But yeah, there was that. And um, so that really makes me wonder. And the thing that intrigues me the most about that is that that's really only what I care about. So every time I log in there, I want to see, you know, and I don't, I don't do it very often. And I wait, you know, six months, I want to see if that's changed. And I want to see what that is. You know, that's, I don't really care that I'm 26% Scandinavian. I want to know what that less than 5% is, you know? Yeah. So did you both do this? Yes, he did it too. Yes. (laughs) Mine was less, uh, 
his was very less interesting. <laughs> he's, he's pretty much white across the board. <laughs> I'm like 80% smack dab in the middle of Europe, maybe something from the Mediterranean, and one lonely ancestor from the middle of Africa. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that was eons oh, ago. That's, that's still all interesting, though. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's uh, mo mostly European. And less um, less unspecified DNA that that fell at the bottom of the yeah, center field somewhere. Yours has to say something. Where's your app? Let me have your phone. <laughs> the phone is gone. It's over in the living I, room. So yeah, but, I have yeah. to look at his. I don't remember what his says as far as the unassigned. That's an interesting. I just remember looking at mine like, oh, this is boring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where do we take this now? Yeah, I don't, and I don't know how much you spent on that, but I think you know, I mine was on sale, and I think it was like seventy nine. It's normally ninety nine or whatever. But I would have loved to try the other websites just to just to compare. You know, well, I took your from I did twenty three and Me. We yeah. both did twenty three and Me. So you can download your raw data and upload it to another, uh, which is what I did. I I uploaded it to Genome Link, and they were able to give me more. That's where I found the 20, the breakdown of the 20. Um, it gave me more information than the 23andMe report, actually. So, And it, it's interesting because it gets into a lot more stuff about your ancestry than ancestry.com. Ancestry.com, if you use that, you got to have patience with that because it's actually seeking out uh, concrete data by family relations, right. whereas uh, 23andMe and the geo genome, genome link. just bases it on your DNA, which goes a lot further. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't care about family relations. So, <laughs> so um, and there's really no way to bring those two together because Ancestry.com is basically well. They have Ancestry.com has yeah, a DNA test they that do. you can do. They do. Is that um, what you did? Yes, you I did. did. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just went for the, uh, the family tree on that. So, and, uh, which is quite taxing, especially if you well, don't have any, I ended up finding hints. out some things on one part of the family that I didn't want to know. So I was like, okay, <laughs> um, let me call up dad and talk to him about this. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. There's that, there's that part of it. Sure. <laughs> but my, yeah. uh, my, Oh, uh, my dad's grandmother, my great grandmother. She uh, she was quite um, adventurous <laughs> and kind of had uh, relationships with um, many other men of different ethnicities and backgrounds. And I was like, okay, so I don't know if that ever filtered into the family bloodline, but you know. She she uh, she got out there. She got around. So <laughs> oh, you, you know you um you had asked me prior to the show if um if the f word was was okay. And now you're kind of you're kind of sugarcoating your story. The <laughs> family. <tree. laughs> I'm not asking you to spill it, but you know she spiced it up a little bit. She spiced it, but yes. but you know people lived differently. You know, 400 years ago, and and in 500 years in the future from now, they'll probably even leave, live even more differently. So let me ask you this because I, you know, it's that, that unspecified DNA or, or relationship of, uh, of, uh, you know, your ancestry and, and who knows what that means, but obviously you have all these companies that are selling this kit and collecting all this DNA, which of course people, you know, we hear people all the time talk about privacy and people don't want to get vaccinated and they're worried about yeah. things in their bloodstream and, and altering DNA and things like that, of course. So, you know, so many of us are willing to throw our, 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 our gene information or genetic information, you know, online that just about anybody can, can look at to a degree. But what do you think about that unspecified part of our DNA and its relationship to to each of us in do you think that there's these companies have information on that 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 we don't get to know about 
Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I think what ever is, since that's what, um, that's what I I think I honestly yeah. think that they do have or have the ability to find out if we have DNA from other planets. And I, and think, I don't yeah. think that they want it out public yet. But they want people to get used to it. So that when they see that small percentage of on a sign, they can start getting used to the idea that there's something that was sideloaded into the gene pool of the human race that doesn't necessarily belong here. And a lot of this, I think, was spurred on um, when during the Clinton administration, when President Clinton came out and gave a, a public address on how mapping the human genome had finally been completed. And now they were finding out certain things. Um, and I think the, uh, the unassigned coincides with that code phrase that the doctors and scientists like to use called junk DNA, which mm -hmm. is not junk at all. It's just they can't explain why it's there. No, they can explain why it's there. They're just not explaining it to us right, right now, I think. And now that term has gone away. You don't hear it as much anymore because people are getting more into Ancestry.com, 23andMe, uh, Genome Link, and all that. And they're realizing, well, what's this unassigned part? That's not junk. That's coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. It is coming. So one of the things that, that I have learned in, in studying this a little bit is the fact that, um, you know, there's DNA that is, been collected from from people who who I don't and I don't know how far they go back, but obviously people have passed on, especially um, especially in the in the um, areas of the world that that are frozen, where they're finding people and they're yeah. collecting DNA. So we get a little bit more information about you know how we're related to those people that they may have found in Norway, Scandinavia, or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, if they were to look at our DNA and map out this unspecified portion, what are they comparing it to? What are the samples? Yeah, I think they have, um, ever since uh, relations, <laughs> foreign re relations, alien relations started up in the 1950s that they've definitely had a solid base to compare it to. Uh, even Zacharias Hitchin, when he was alive, had pointed out that um, in our DNA, in our chromosomes, um, when you uh, remove all the stuff that is human and primate or chimpanzee that we're related to, um, that there's still a certain fraction that is non-indigenous and does not come from Earth, Earth gene pool. So even that research couldn't be refuted. And the fact that there's only, um, what is it, one or two chromosomes difference between us and a chimpanzee. Well, if we added a few more, if we could add a few more chromosomes to us, how different would we look at that point? We might look like one of the aliens. So, um, the, chromo the, uh, the, the chromosomal structure in our DNA, uh, there's really not much tweaking that needs to be done to make that leap to extraterrestrial. <clears throat> yeah, there's such a close relationship there and the ongoing uh, dialogue that's been going on with um, certain exchange programs where some of them stay here and some of us go to their planet for uh, several years, and then they come back and report on what it was like there, and, and the ones that were here go back to their planet. Um, there's plenty of uh, scientific information that's come out of that in terms of DNA and finding out and comparing it to this unassigned that you find on 23andMe or something like that. Um, so I think this is their way, these companies who offer these um, family trees and DNA services. This is their way of getting people on board with the next phase of understanding that, well, you first have to get used to the idea that you have, just because you look white, 
you have plenty of African, Asian, Arabian, and South American blood in you. And look at where your family tree grows. Now, if you can accept that without making a joke out of it or being in disbelief, then maybe you can handle what this unassigned is that we're presenting to you right now. And we'll explain that to you 30 years down the line. Okay. God, I hope I don't have to wait 30 more <laughs> so, years. Well, there, these things happen in phases. So I know that. Yeah. And it and, and it's also happening quicker. I mean, technology yeah. yes, it is. changes overnight. And we're learning things that we wouldn't have even imagined. And, you know, tomorrow morning we can look at the news or whatever. It's just, it changes everything. No, it is changing. And we, we finally have, we finally have the Vatican admitting that there's poss potential life out there. We have the government finally saying that, yes, this, that, and the other thing happened. So hopefully that unassigned will finally come out and say, yes, we've been tracking all of your DNA and this percentage is from Andromeda, that percentage is from the Pleiades, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't want to be from the Pleiades, but so let me ask you this. If they have, okay, assume everybody assumes that, um, or they don't assume, but one of the assumptions they do make is the fact that, or is the assumption that that little bit of DNA or, or, or relationship to whatever else is out there um, is being kept secret from us because we can't handle it. Okay. Or for some other reason, what other reason right. could there be? I'm, I don't really like that assumption that we can't handle it. Um, I, I don't well, think, that, I don't think that we can handle it, but could there be some other reason that this is be, being kept from us? I guess that's my question. I'm sure there is, but um, they're probably researching maybe certain species from other planets have the ability to self heal or that group over there has the treatment for cancer for the other race that's over here. They, this could be umpteen different reasons why they're researching it right now and haven't told us. Individually, it's okay for us to look at it and say, hey, well, why are you treating me like that? I would understand, I would accept it. But I think a lot of us have to get our ego out of the way and realize those of us who understand it represent only 20% of the population. What about the other 80% that's still fighting over things like- Religion. Religion, white nationalism, the politic, political climate we're in right now with the nation being divided in half. And now you're gonna introduce well, now some of you are aliens. Well, how quick would it be to turn that into a racist agenda and stick everyone in District 13 like Timothy Jackson did in that movie? So, you know, who's going to be sent to the concentration camp now? Who's going to be labeled with a brand new expanded definition of illegal alien? So these are all the ridiculous things that will crop up. And I know that kind of stupidity it's hard for the smart people to comprehend when you're isolated and thinking about it in an objective, reasonable manner. But when you're in the crowd mentality, forget it. And that's the problem. We are still hinged on that ridiculous political crowd mentality of, well, this is my belief and this is the line in the sand I'm drawing. I'm not crossing it. And if you cross that line, I'm going to blow your brains out. Okay, fine. Well, then we can't talk to you and we can't tell you the truth if you're going to act irresponsible like that. And that's the broader scope of it. I mean, you and I can sit here and philosophize all day long why they're wrong for holding that information back. But you take a walk down the neighborhood and you realize, oh, that one looks like an asshole. That's an idiot. He's kicking the mailbox there because he can't get into the mailbox and get his mail. What is that? What message does that send to the aliens? How are you supposed to handle that you have alien DNA when you're beating the shit out of the mailbox just because you can't get your mail? Yeah, why do people? That's what you have to analyze. That's what you have to observe. You have to be observant of the human race around you. You cannot be so self-centered as to think, well, I'm the intelligent one. Why aren't they talking to me? Because you're a minority. Smart people are in the minority. Dumb people are in the majority. That's why we have the political climate we're in. And that's why the aliens say, screw it. We're going to wait another 50 years for these idiots to wise up. I can't, I hate it when people say, well, they talk to me. Great. That's good for you. Go puff up your ego somewhere else. You're a minority. Get lost. 
you don't represent the majority. Do you ever think there is the decision being made out there for for our benefit, so to speak, that um, somebody higher up in the who knows where looking at us and saying, you know what, there's there's a higher higher plane out there. There's a, a technology and it, it far exceeds what we have. What could we possibly do for these organisms out there? And, you know, if we announce that and if they find out our vulnerabilities, we're, we're toast. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to be a shock to the human race to find, to find out that God is flesh and blown bone and bleeds just like us. I would be shocked. So you're both writers and um, yep. you're, you're both big thinkers. Do you always agree on everything? And if not, no. <laughs> I, I, then that's interesting to me because I mean, you're, you're together and you're sharing the same space, but what do you disagree on as, as far as our origin and where we came from? I would like to hear about that because you know, that those are good talking points. Because mm -hmm. if you have, if you have, you live together and you're so set on that idea, that's important. Even if they're different, they're important. Yeah, no. And I think the fact that we respect each other's differences for 26 years. Yes, it's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, what don't we agree upon? God, we, 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 we spat every once in a while about that whole alien agenda thing. Mm -hmm. What was one specific one that we were back and forth about? I don't remember now. Um, how... I mean, it's not a big deal to me. We, we, we say our differences and then we move on. So I, usually I don't remember them. How I think the human race is not ready for this. And Linda thinks that we are. Oh, yeah, I do. We go back and forth about that. So I think... I think the majority of us have been so brainwashed since the 50s, maybe even late 40s, that, oh, we can't handle this, that, and the other thing, that, that we just assume, yeah, we can't handle it. But no, I think, I think if you give the majority the benefit of the doubt and give all that information out, I think more people like Richard would be surprised. I think that they would, they might be in shock about it, but I think that they would be okay with it. And I feel that a bunch of nut job fanatics would turn it into a religious agenda and a political agenda. You're always gonna have that. Yeah. You're always gonna have that. We have that And now. those are the people who created Hitler. Okay? All right. Those are created, those are the ones who created Idi Amin. Okay? Those are the ones who created every dictator since the beginning of time. Yeah, and the Sata queens are not dictators? Yes, they are. All right then. So with our with the information and, and how it's readily available to us, do you think that it's possible that that wouldn't happen because we're more educated and we're not gonna buy into that? I mean, it's possible that a percentage would, of course, but then. Yeah, you're always gonna have a group that's gonna flip out and be stupid over something. But I think as a whole, now that there's more people aware and there was something that I read recently that they did a survey and there's more people out there that believe in alien life than not nowadays. So I think they've had enough time for it to stew that if there was an announcement on the news or something tomorrow, that everybody would be a lot more okay with it than you think. And my attitude would be, okay, what's their agenda behind releasing that truth? What are they trying to take advantage of? And what kind of false flag operation are they going to put forth? Oh, the aliens are coming. Oh, look, it's an invasion. Let's amp up the military budget and take over the country. Well, yeah. Martial law. Yeah. That... <clears throat> we need a new enemy all the time. Yeah. Terrorism has failed to produce the enemy. Okay. Well, There's no more Cold War. It's been said that that's going to be the next false flag. So the is next the false alien flag invasion. is an invasion from Mars, which the military already has a presence on. I know that. So, you know, it's just like, are people smart enough to know the difference? And No, they're not. 
how many false flags, including the World Trade Center disaster, have duped everyone into thinking we were attacked? So uh, events like that, do you think that um, what happened to us where we became so short? We, be, we have this short memory. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. remember, remember 9-11, everybody had their flag out and it was just like, yeah. And then not the next day, but days later it was, we moved on and, and then, and there are these, these other big terrorist events and, and we've been in wars and we've, we've, uh, you know, just pulled out of, of Afghanistan and, and the president looks like a total whatever, but there's this, this memory that we have that just somehow we just move on and and um once we get to that next thing it it becomes less and less of a big deal why is that i mean it's mm. part of being human i'm sure but um is it because we're totally bombarded with too much information that's possible the internet was supposed to help us or create less work i think it's created more work you get more information more crap thrown at you on a daily basis from every app that's out there, everybody's got an opinion that this is fact. And I think everybody's, well, the majority that I believe in are just like, yeah, whatever. I've been kind of on hiatus because of whatever, for whatever reason, but, and haven't produced many podcasts since July, but, um, you know, thinking about that and, and when I was going to start doing this again and why I just, one of the things that get popping up is, is am I part of the fucking problem? You know, <laughs> am I part of the reason why people have this weird short memory. And, and I know I do. It's not that I quit thinking about things, these bad things that have happened because obviously nine 11 was a big, a big event in my life. And I was stuck in the middle of America and couldn't get home and with my family. But, um, you know, there are things that have happened that, you know, obviously my mind has moved on and um, I don't want to think about it. And, um, you know, on a daily basis, I, I have this potential of picking up my phone and being bombarded by all this shitty information. And I'm, yeah. really, ti and I'm really tired of it. You know, um, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I hate listening to the news in the morning, hearing about COVID, you know, but you know, right. I mean, that's, there are people out there who just can't get enough of it. And I'm, I've had it. I know. I, I, that's quite possibly what's happening to the majority is they're just, they're shutting down. They don't want to hear all this nonsense. They get desensitized from yeah. overload. And I think that's become an easy exclamation point to put at the end of a very long paragraph that started in the 1980s. Um, when you go back to that generation of 50s, 60s, 70s, everybody had a much more expanded vocabulary. You get to the 80s, that vocabulary was still there, but it started being stunted down. You get through the 90s, less of a vocabulary. But I get to, by the time you get to the year 2000, the population got so dumbed down by big pharma and drugs and antidepressants and then alcohol and street drugs, that the gene pool became illiterate to the point of voting for George W. Bush. And that's how he gets into the White House as an exclamation point on the stupidity of that generation that had come to the point of having a very stunted vocabulary that didn't even compare to the generation that came before it, which was much more intelligent and much more book read, much more able to verse in politics and economics by the time you get to the year 2000, you try to talk to someone about that kind of stuff. It's just like, you know, um, what was it? Dude, where's my car was the sum total of the discussion at that point. Okay. With those two idiots. But, um, and then as it goes from there, it just gets less and less to the point where you get this deer caught in the headlights look when you use a $50 word on somebody that's right in the dictionary. And it's like, did you look in the dictionary? No. Do you know what a dictionary is anymore? No. Well, they do have it online, but you don't even use it there. Why? 
oh, I just don't care, you know, because you're too busy watching music videos that stunt you down. You're too busy speaking in a Twitter lingo, which now is it's, ignorant. You, it's, it's, we're past watching music videos. Now it's TikTok. Right. That's what I was getting to. Or YouTube influencers, Ten which seconds. they know. It's the YouTube, huh? it's the Twitter. It, it, it's something. 10 seconds, you know, or a 30 second or 20 yeah, second their, film. Yeah, their attention span is, is about um, the size of a gnat. And, but they can, they can spew out one influencer name after another or the Kardashians or whatever else. Ask them the presidents in order or ask them what president we have now or who's the chief of staff or who's the secretary. Or how many planets are or, in the yeah, solar system. Ask them <laughs> a fifth grade social studies that varies. <laughs> Ask him what the names of the planets are. Oh my God, I remember this, this dumbass in eighth grade. She couldn't even name the name of the planets. I was like, you're in eighth grade. And my science teacher is looking at her like, you don't know the names of the planets? How far did you make it this far? I'm talking about the current situation. Yeah. The kids out there, if there's, uh, who was it? Is it Jimmy Kimmel? I don't remember who was out there asking questions. And these kids couldn't answer any of those questions, mm. but they knew who Kim Kardashian was and they knew who Kanye West was, uh, all those influencers out there. Yeah, I'm hoping they they showed us all the stuff that we wanted to see. I mean, obviously they're putting stuff on Jimmy Kimmel, whoever, Jimmy Fallon, putting things mm -hmm. on that we want to see. It's not funny if they answer it correctly. So right. there, there's a, there's a, a slant there, but... <laughs> let, me, let me ask so yeah everybody's part of the problem obviously i mean yes this is something that people are going to watch but there's not going to be any editing here um i don't ever edit anything um you know i'll take out some you know if we have a, a problem with the internet or whatever and and splice that back together but um you know for the most part you know it's it's to keep it real and um people want to hear a real conversation but um one of the things that that I wonder about and how this came to be. I mean, obviously we're in, people will say a pandemic. I say it's an end endemic because it is, it's not going away ever. I don't think, I mean, obviously later on years, years in the future, um, genetically we could probably solve the problem, but how is this different than, than polio and, and uh, smallpox and, 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 and and measles you know um Not. and i i believe that but there are a lot of people out there who believe it's it's something different and um um and they cause this problem it has to do with believing yeah a lot has to do with believing that history is based on a a 10-year grading scale instead of looking at the last 1000 years you try to talk to someone from about what happened 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and once again, glossy eyed deer caught in the headlights. You know, the younger generation thinks anything from last year is old. There, there was so, some bad, bad shit 50 years ago and 100 years ago. I mean, I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't trade now for that ever. No, and that's the thing that there's a disconnect there. And this, you know, interesting segue this is why linda and i are so focused on human origins because we have a tremendous horrid disconnect between modern society and ancient history when we don't we fail to comprehend that they're a mirror reflection of each other there's nothing different about ancient history that's happening today and history will always repeat itself for those who do not learn from it if we think the invention of an iPad is something unique to the 21st century. We are seriously deluding ourselves because that was here 10,000 years ago. If we think a laptop computer or a smart TV is something new, that's ridiculous. They had it 10,000 years ago. They had smoke glass buildings. They had fax machines, okay? It's, uh, it's in the architecture. It's carved into the walls. It's in the wall reliefs. You just have to know how to look for it. They had satellites up in space. The Moai of Easter Island are wearing Bluetooth devices on the ears, and these dumbass academics would have you think it's an earring or an ornament. So that's a good segue to talk about what you both write about. Um, Linda, 
talk about what you write about. And then of course we'll go to Richard, but um, why did you, how did that happen? I mean, talk about what you write about and how that happened and, and why is it important? Um, I actually fought Richard for <laughs> two years <laughs> yes. before I actually finally agreed to publish my book. Um, that's that's something else we fight over too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> to me, it, I didn't. It, it was something very personal for me. It was my mom's um, log, diary, journal, whatever you want to call it, of all of her sightings that she had had starting in December of ninety four. Um, then it was also my journal writings, experiences that happened with my ex-husband, my kids, my sister, myself, my parents. And somebody was looking through it one day and said, you should make this into a book. And I went, oh, hell no, (laughs) no, that's airing dirty laundry because growing up in the East coast in New York it's not a normal conversation to talk about UFOs and et cetera. I was made fun of, I didn't like it. So I moved to New Mexico five years ago and it's like talking about what roll of toilet paper did you buy? Everybody talks about it's open, it's Mm -hmm. nothing. So I published the book finally after a lot of yelling and screaming between the two of us about it uh, in 2017. Uh, it's 17 or yes. 18, whatever. Yeah. And I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, thank you so much for writing this because now I don't feel like I'm crazy. Now I believe that my experiences that I had are real. Which shocked me because I really didn't think anybody would read it. Um, it's just, All of our experiences, well, not all of them. It's what I could remember and put into the book. It starts, my first memory started in 1967 when I was three. And it has continued on to this day and I'll be 58. Somebody was shocked the other day that I was still having experiences. It was Alan Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Right. He was shocked that I was still having experiences. So... So this is this is the question I ask all the time. It's because somehow I get connected with people like you because we're the same age. And oh, okay. You know, some of that those experiences are the same or whatever. But um, it, to me, it's interesting that um, so many people of the same age had so many similar experiences in the same years. So what okay. is that? What is that? That's that's interesting to me, hugely interesting because I meet people all the time. And, and if I meet somebody, um, who's 55, 56 years old, you know what I want to ask them. I don't, but you know, I mean, a total stranger, or whatever. I, I don't so go, Have you had any alien experiences? I don't and they look at you like, like what? Like, Where the hell did that come from? Yes, I know. <laughs> but I, I know. But I, How about so, those Yankees? So, <laughs> so this guy, I was, I met this guy the other day and he was, he was talking about, he was like five years older than me, but he was talking about um, being in Montana and being in the air force and working at these, um, these radar sites, you know, early, early in his military career, you know? And so I started to ask him and um, you know, and so, you know, would you see out there, uh, anything strange and oh you wouldn't believe it and i was like okay here we go and you know these people would come up and they would try to you know get in and get in through the fence and da 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 and but it only happened two times or whatever and you know i just kept prodding him and and trying to direct the conversation but it never ever went there so sometimes i can't get there but you know um i don't i don't really like to to get into those conversations anymore just because um i've had plenty but, uh, you know, it's, it's, people are kind of on a different level. And I think, you know, if, if, if I kind of can gauge where they grew up and, and, you know, as long as it wasn't the big city, you know, if they lived out in the country, we can find some common ground, but you know, it's the age and, and the years that happen. Why is that with that era of people? I've heard other people say it was the first wave. 
of maybe hybrid children here on earth? What are you? I can speak from the perspective of being born in the 70s. So I was born in 1970. And I know that the, all those 70s babies came through uh, and were born in that decade for a reason. And I didn't realize what that reason was until I had reached the age of 21. Maybe we're the test group. Probably. <laughs> the 60s babies are the I test group. I mean, that would seem like a good answer. I mean, why not? You know? Mm -hmm. Let's see how this group well, I know that fits in on Earth because they're not 100 percent. Yeah, I know that what was coming out of the 60s was a huge impetus for these extraterrestrial groups to move forward and get those, as ridiculous as it sounds to say it this way, get those babies born in the 70s. So that by time, by the time the 90s came along, they would be coming into their own. And in that decade of trial and tribulation known as the 90s, they would be able to take the reins of the 21st century. Not if they're the bumbling idiots that you just said. That's true. We're not going there anymore. Okay. You know, one of the, <laughs> one of the reasons, you know, I kind of look at this in, in many different, um, at many different angles of this, but, um, you know, um, Sometimes I like to think that maybe we, we've been watched for a very long time, but then all of oh, a sudden, yeah. sudden somebody new arrived, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I don't even like to say that we're particularly interesting because, you know, a, a, a species that have maybe were, were star travelers that came billions and trillions of miles away. Um, we're probably not that interesting. However, you know, there is one thing that we probably, if, if, if they did travel a long ways, probably what would differ us from other organisms out there is the fact that, you know, during the 70s, 60s, 70s, especially in the 80s, and then hugely into the 90s, it's the ownership of property, you know, like, I always tell people when I was a kid, we didn't drink water, we didn't have a backpack, we didn't bring anything to school take anything home from school, you know, um, we, <laughs> yes. maybe did, got to high school, you know, maybe, maybe some, you know, your shorts, your shoes, whatever. But um, now, you know, my son, he, he's 15, he has three backpacks and they're just loaded. He can hardly carry them. And I don't uh, know what the hell is in there, you know, and then he'll go to like uh, a friend's house or his brother's house and he packs up his PlayStation and there's another backpack and, <laughs> so it's, it's incredible, you know, interest to me is like, you know, all these kids own so much stuff. Um, you know, a lot of kids don't even own a bike now, but they own so many electronics. But the other thing too, is the, you know, we, we had people in, on the planet who have amassed these huge herds of, of large animals and they're just slaughtering them and killing them and eating them. You know, to me, that's, um, you know, worth noting. And, um, which probably makes us a lot different because, you know, um, uh, somebody who, who traveled here probably didn't have a herd of, of animals that they fed on along the way. It's gotta be something, you know, a light snack somehow real light, you know, and, but it, it's just that, um, you know, we, we've become hugely interesting in the last, you know, 45 years or so and, um, 50 years and we're, we're completely different, you know, things changed a lot. And we were, we're reaching, right, we were right in the yeah. middle of it, you know, yeah. we're, we're, right we're reaching a state of critical mass. That's why that, that too. And then, you know, this population explosion is supposed to be 10 billion in 30 years from now or something like that. It's, it's, it, there's a critical mass and something's really going to change. There's going to be, it's going to lean one way or the other. And I can't see it being good. It's going to force our hand to all that um, Black Ops, Secret Project, Area 51 stuff that's been going on with uh, the Secret Space Program, the Dark Side of the Moon, Mars, the Asteroid Belt, 
the moons of Jupiter, okay, all that stuff. You know, this this is how we start gradually getting used to knowing about that through unassigned DNA in our 23andMe. That's the first step. Second step will be, oh, population explosion. Well, now we got to do something about it. Well, now we got to go colonize the moon, Mars, and everything else under the sun to accommodate that growing population because um, no one wants to talk about culling the herd. So uh, let's just go colonize something else. Now that technology that has been happening illegitimately and behind the scenes with secret programs then gets handed off to corporations like Virgin Galactic and whatnot, or Tesla, and then it becomes legitimized because then it gets watered down into the commercial sector from the military. So that also gets us used to the, oh, the corporations are inventing this new, you know, world of the future for us, you know, like mm -hmm. the world of tomorrow that they had back in the 40s and 50s, all right, all that stuff. Well, now it's becoming true. Um, and we're looking at it from the lens scope of, oh, we invented all this and all these smart people like Steve Jobs and whoever else has invented it. No, they really didn't invent a damn thing. They just borrowed it from ancient history and then regurgitated it through the lens scope of what was funneled down from the military and then fed it out to the public in a matter that looks pristine and new. And, oh, look, we're going to go colonize Mars with our brand spanking new iPads. So, you know, there's this watered down effect that gets us used to it and gets us more in line with accepting it, accepting it, accepting it until we finally peel that onion back far enough to look at the root of the onion and realize, oh, we've been part of this galactic family all along. This is nothing new. We are just simply revisiting Genesis. We are returning back to our roots. The problem is, like you said, are, you know, you alluded to before, are we going the right path on that? Or are we going on a self-destructive path? We're putting a lot of faith on the doorstep of corporations who are merely interested in money. So how safe is that colony gonna be on Mars when they're gonna cut corners to save expenses? How safe is that colony gonna be on one of the biggest asteroids in the asteroid belt or one of the moons of Jupiter? You know, like Ridley Scott says in the movie Alien, <laughs> you, there, there's, no, there's no sound in space. You can't scream in space. So if a colony is going to be lost, who's going to know? And this is the risk you take at putting yourself at the doorstep of a corporation who had it filtered down to them from a black ops military that's not even part of the legitimate U.S. military. So, you know, this is, you know, it's like, okay, we're getting conditioned to accept these things, but we're can, getting conditioned through a very corrupt and belligerent filter. Richard, when you meet somebody for the first time and, and you tell them you're an author, you know, they have no idea what you write about. I mean, well, how's that conversation go? What, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want this person to know? If you only had 45 seconds to, to talk to them because there's, there's a lot there and you, mm. you, you, you throw out a lot of information on a lot of different subjects. Um, ultimately it's kind of, you know, I know where you're going and I know what that is, but you know, how, do, how would you, how would you, um, what would your annotated bibliography be for a total stranger? How, um, um, how the ancient history of the human race uh, relates to extraterrestrial contact. That's how I would describe it. But not how, how not that though, but I mean, what, what do you want them to know? I mean, what's, what's in there that just so important oh. that you want, that it screams to you and you want it, you want them to hear about it. Something that. What you put on Right. Yes. I have a um, something I've written into one of my books. It's a quote I have on my biography. Um, it's um, you have to know the ancient history of where you come from before you know the wisdom of where you're going in the near and distant future. 
you have to know your past to know your future because it's an endless cycle. And if you don't know the past, then you're doomed to repeat all those horrid mistakes and end up back at square one again. And we have a lot of authors out there who, who are taking this information from the past and, and this not even recent history, um, history from long ago, and, and providing some sort of interpretation. What's, what's the real answer? What's, what's the information out there that, um, you know, w- what should we be looking at and learning from? Because obviously, we, there's a lot of people out there who've found information, whether it be archaeological, whatever, and, and there's some whacked interpretations. So what's your go-to? What, do you, what, what makes you feel the most confident about the work that's out there? Does that make sense? I know what I want to say, but um, say I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be nice about it. Oh. So <laughs> we're not here to be nice. Okay. Um, what keep it real? Yeah. In plain old black and white, I would want people to realize that the biggest problem we have about our ancient history, our modern society, and comprehending what extraterrestrial contact really means is that we have corrupted that narrative with a strictly a strictly white eurocentric narrative on history and until we learn to get that the hell out of the way we're never going to get to the truth you look at everything that they broadcast on those ancient aliens programs it's all a white narrative you look at everything that is put forth in ufology it's all a white narrative You look at the history books from academia. It's all Hufflin, uh, uh, what's the the academic publisher, Hufflin Mifflin, whatever they call them. Hooten Mifflin. Yeah, it's all white narrative. Right. There, I mean, I even, in grade school and in college, I had teachers tell me, we're just focusing on the European perspective. The rest of it is not important. Really? Okay. Well, that European perspective is bullshit, top to bottom. Okay. I can rip the rug out from under it in three seconds flat. Okay. Um, Because fact number one, Europe gets its false origin story from a manufactured and fabricated country known as Greece. When the truth of the matter is, there is no such thing as a Greek philosopher, never has been, never will be, because all Greek philosophers came from a very dark-skinned Egypt. So all philosophers are Egyptian, not Greek. Socrates is a prime example. He was Egyptian through and through, and his own Grecian people slaughtered him and poisoned him for it because they were afraid of him, because all of his knowledge came from Egypt. So once you start tearing down that first Lego block, all of European history falls flat on its face because all of European history hedges its bets on Greece. And I, agree, I agree. I mean, even, even Christianity is, is really a white. Yes. A yes. White man's game. I mean, it's, um, it, now, would, it would look yeah. vastly different if we had the real story somehow. And yes. And I think that's the part where I start agreeing with Linda about releasing this, because if we want to bring this whole, uh, hateful white backlash to an end, then this stuff does need to be released. Come hell or high water, if we blow ourselves up, all right, fuck it, just release it. And if all the white people and all the Christians want to commit suicide, then let them, okay? Because they were the weakest link in the chain and who the hell needs them? Uh, they didn't invent the light bulb, Thomas Edison. That's another Lego block I can knock down. Uh, Thomas Edison was a racist anti-Semite, and anyone who hates Hollywood really needs to get a grip on history, because if it wasn't for Thomas Edison, there'd be no such thing as Hollywood. Thomas Edison uh, engaged in a blacklist program to marginalize all those second-generation Jews that were trying to get into the film industry as it originally existed on the East Coast of the United States. And because he blacklisted all of them 
and made it impossible for them to get hired in the film industry, they said, screw it. You want to marginalize us? You want to blacklist us? Fine, we'll go out west. And they bought this little pissant town called Hollywood and turned it into what it is today. You want to piss and moan about Hollywood? Fine, then I, I suggest you erase Thomas Edison from history. Second of all, he's a thief. He stole the original science fiction movie from a French director from the earth to the moon, brought it over to the United States and started promoting it as his own, made buco dollars off of promoting that film and not one red cent ever went to the French director and he died in poverty because everybody in France laughed at him. But over here in the United States, we ate it up. Wow, the first science fiction movie from the earth to the moon because it was done with a white guy, Thomas Edison. Third of all, he didn't invent the light bulb. The Egyptians did 5,000 years before that dumbass was even a glint in his father's eye. So God forbid we should give attribution to black people because the white guy has to be referred to as the father of invention. And I challenge you to go and say, okay, would we still call him the father of invention if he was seven shades darker? Answer, no. That, would, that title would have gone to some other white guy, not Thomas Edison if he was seven shades darker. And yet when you look at black history, you find out it was a black inventor who actually created the light bulb to give us light in our homes, regardless of what Edison might have contributed, okay? Fourth of all, he is a thug who went out of his way to destroy his own prime star student, Nikola Tesla, simply because of the dumbass mentality that would have freed the human race with alternate current AC as opposed to direct current DC. Edison was all about DC. Why? Because the mentality was DC for Washington, DC, not AC. Nobody would be able to relate to it. <laughs> so what does this sadistic idiot do? He goes out and electrocutes an elephant in front of everyone to try and prove how Tesla's tower would destroy the earth. And he made a complete fool of himself because all the news reporters are like, Edison, you are an idiot. Of course, if you'll electrocute an elephant, it's going to die. Dumbass. So, you know, and to this day, you still find these so-called enlightened people who still worship at the altar of Thomas Edison because it's a white narrative. So this is what I'm talking about. Ufology, ancient aliens, all of that is corrupted by a strictly white narrative with no regard whatsoever for Native Africans, Native Americans, Native Arabians, Native Asians, and understanding it from their perspective. And I challenge people on that even in my lectures. I tell them, look, you're only listening to me because I'm white, but guess where I got it from? I got it from your dark skinned elders, the one you laughed at because you were programmed and brainwashed to reject your own elders by white people like me who wanted to assimilate you into the white narrative so you could feel equal. But I got it from your black elders, your dark skinned elders. So if it's okay to get it from me, why aren't you listening to them? Because that's where I got it from. And then they have to think about that. Same thing with women. We have a misogynistic narrative on this planet that completely obliterates women from the conversation. I don't give a damn what the hell kind of progress has been made or what you can point to figure, oh, women are much better now. The fact that you have to say that says we haven't made progress. If you have to point it out, then you haven't made progress because the only reason you're gonna point it out is because you are guilty as charged, okay? So the fact that we have this culture of rape in our democracy against women who serve as the foundation of the real power of ancient history makes it quite clear that there is an extraterrestrial agenda against the female principle and the feminine goddess energy. I'm not talking about the benevolent factions like the Star Nations or the, the Ponti or whatever, or the Zeta Reticuli. I'm talking about these scumbags from the Orion Empire who see women as a threat since ancient times. Since ancient history, the greys have always seen the female principle, the real power, the feminine goddess energy as an absolute adversary that they could never control or dominate. And so what do they do? They turn men into the idiots who dominate the women as a middleman. And by fear and paranoia, they destroyed the woman's psychic ability by making her terrified of her husband, her brother, and her father, and forced her to her knees in fear and obedience. 
That's a fact. And there's not one feminist out there who would argue against that. Um, that's a known fact about history. And that came straight out of a more malevolent faction that sees the human race as nothing more than a social security number that can be replaced. So now you have this groundswell, this vibrant, voracious groundswell of the female principle and the feminine goddess energy now taking its rightful place in the 21st century right alongside people of color finally being recognized for the truth that they represent. And all of a sudden the white narrative is lost and doesn't know how to handle that because the white narrative has always been at the top of a very false pedestal. And now the white narrative has to get its ass booted out of the way to make room for the truth and stop giving it through a false lens scope of whitewashing, white power, white nationalism, white supremacy, white corporations, white bread, white sugar, white flour, white salt, okay? I name it that way because even in the health industry, it is understood as a fundamental law that anything that's white is evil to the human body. White flour, white sugar, white salt, white bread, all evil to the immune system. Big Pharma knows that, and they've gone after the human system lock, stock, and barrel to dumb us down because to attack the human body is to attack our ancient legacy and remove us from the scenario, okay? So this is what's going on here. We have a terrible, terrible 10,000 years or more of bad behavior, and it's very hard to break that habit when you are so used to being the white guy at the top of the pyramid of power. I agree. And one of the things that um, struck me is, is the fact that, um, you know, we could admit that and I'm talking, I want to talk about women in general that, you know, we can't live without them, but you know, there, there, there's such a disparity of treatment and, and poor treatment. And, um, you know, the, the, probably the strongest, for sure, the strongest member of our weird society and how that happened and the history of that is, is, you know, you, you, you look at it in a way that, that, you know, what's, what's the equalizer. I mean, we've never been able to, to find that. And it's, and it's not only are we fighting ourselves, but we're, we're fighting amongst um, our own race and, and against women. And, and it's hard to, to find a way to, to fix that. I mean, it's like, we, we look at war in the middle East and how that could never resolve itself but you know we're fighting this not even a mini war a major war amongst men and women all every day and it's and it's i don't know um right and the, and the actual just like greece uh the middle the very reference to something being called the middle east is a figment of the imagination. That was another social experiment that was invented by the European colonizers who went down there and created all these different illegitimate borders and nation states that didn't exist beforehand. And by forcing those people into those containers, this began the friction. Nowadays, we look at it as, oh, Jew versus Muslim, Muslim versus Jew. No, that's a white narrative via colonization. And this is the, the mess that Europe left behind. And now it's like, well, why doesn't the United States fix this? Well, what's the United States gonna do? We're dealing with our own mess as a colonized nation. For so, sure. <laughs> so how are we supposed to lecture the Middle East when we are still coming out of the bigoted mentality of 13 colonies, 13 slave colonies at that, which weren't supposed to be here and were only placed here illegitimately to replace something else that had a legitimate reason to be here in the first place. Uh, and we're not just talking about Native Americans, we were talking about the entire scope of what I talk about in my, in my books called the Moorish legacy, which includes Native America. So that's the other aspect too. We, the Native, the Moorish legacy represents the Christ energy 
and the female principle represents the real power. And those two things go hand in hand. And the original political power couples that represented that were people like Isis and Osiris, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, okay? Those were political power couples who represented the combination of the Brill and the Christ. And the Brill, the woman, carried all the political power. And the Christ carried the message. He was the teacher. And the only reason his head remained attached to his body was because the woman had his back. You see this in ancient Egypt. Uh, once again, this is the difference between a white narrative and the truth. When you look at an Egyptian statue of a female, she'll be standing there, and it looks like on the surface, from a male misogynistic point of view, that she is behind the man, but she's not. She is presenting the man in front of her with her hand on his shoulder as if to say, this is who I've chosen to be my mate because she's the one in charge. It goes back to the old phrase, behind every good man is a greater woman or a better woman. And that is an Egyptian understanding because Egypt was a matriarchy. It so is like Native Americans. Native Americans, clan mothers, matriarchy, okay? The only reason that fell out of sway was because of that agenda to go out there and destroy on purpose via the mandates of the greys to destroy anything that's seven shades darker and anything that takes orders from a female. That was immediately labeled as, that's not Christian. You must listen to your man. Well, excuse me, but the last time I checked, when you look at a household that's run by a man, it's upside down and dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> The I only type of that. order you yeah. have is a yeah. house run by the woman. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we got like two minutes and I want to, I kind of want to know what you're, what you got planned next, because um, it's interesting to me. And, and Linda, you kind of alluded to the fact that you wrote, you wrote about your life, but there's more. Give us a hint. Richard and I created the Human Origins Foundation back in 2017. Yeah. It started out as the UFO Global Initiative with Richard by himself doing it with somebody from Australia, I think it was, or something. Yeah. yeah. And that didn't pan out. And then when I moved here to New Mexico, he was talking about this whole global initiative to get the word out about alien contact, the human art, the human origins and forgotten knowledge, ancient history. And I said, look, I have large event experience. You have the information, you know who to get together. Let's just put this all together. Let's do a conference. And the first human origins conference was 2018. Mm -hmm. And then in- And it received a lot of great feedback yeah. and people wanted more. And we were, we're like, okay. You know, um, then COVID hit and we didn't have the next one. We had what? So, we had, yeah, it's 2019 into 2020. Yeah. That all just got sandbagged. So our next one is in May of 2022. And we have, God, I don't remember, 12, 14 speakers 13. for the Human Origins Conference. 13, magic number in 13. Al Albuquerque. <laughs> Um, we have the, the foundation is what runs the whole thing. Um, people can go to humanoriginsconference.com. Mm -hmm. Go get your tickets. They're on the early bird special now until December. And so, all the speakers are listed there, everything. Yes, you have all the speakers. Our newest one, our last one to come on board was Dr. Rita Louise. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have an excellent lineup, including uh, Dr. Robert Schock. Dr. Robert Schock. Um, Brooks Agnew, George Haas, uh, Cynthia Martinell, Cynthia Martinell, Nyla Gilliam, Dr. Right. Nyla Gilliam, right? And we have a lot of Vivian Chauvet, yes, yeah. Vivian Chauvet, uh, and many others. So just go to the website and take a look at it. Uh, I have to update the speakers page to include uh, Dr. Louise because she just recently filled that 13th gap, but um. Yeah, don't miss out on if uh, if anybody wants to know more about Linda and myself, 
Our official website is ufoteacher.com. Awesome. So Richard, is there another, the more the Mason and the alien? In there, store. I'm trying to get Linda to get, get going on a second book for herself here. She's got lots of ideas yeah. and is trying to collate them into something. But for myself, I'm working on right now uh, the fourth book in the series, uh, The More of the Mason Alien Part Three, Rise of the Invisible College. So, and it's going to talk about the power of the Invisible College with that Moorish, Masonic, and alien symbolism that runs through it and how it's been, once again, just like 23andMe, you know, these movies that educate the human race to get used to certain ideas. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be uh, uh, received well as part three. So. Yeah. <laughs> All the others. Sure will. All right, Richard and Linda Smith are both students of human origin. And um, other than ufoteacher.com, where else do they look for you online? Humanoriginsconference.com. Oh, yeah. And of course, we're on Facebook and Twitter yeah. and Instagram. Yeah. So they can find us on there too. Yeah. Um, They're everywhere. Yeah, that's good. And then YouTube and my website. YouTube, yes. LinkedIn. Yeah. Right. So, I'm on TikTok too, but. I don't have my name on there. You you actually produce TikTok videos, all right? Yes, I do. <laughs> Richard Linda Smith, thank <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. As always, check out the podcast at myalienlifepodcast.com. dot uh, com. The music heard on tonight's program is by Elion. You can find all Elion's music on Hard Dance Records. And uh, tonight's audio, video engineer and producer is Cassidy Lightwing. I'm Cam Logan. Be sure to listen to previous shows available everywhere you hear fine podcasts. Thanks, everybody. Good night.